What is up, Bengals fan? It's your boys, Mike. Again, coming back at you with another Who Daily. We have the one, the only, Lindsey Patterson on the show. How you doing, Lindsey? I'm good. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, we've been doing interviews this week, mostly because um, it's draft week, and I've done so many mock drafts on the channel at this point, I think people <laughs> might be getting tired of it. So... Uh, what we wanted to, I just wanted to you know, bring in, uh, actually you were the first person to accept um, my invitation to come on the show, so very much appreciate that. Um, I, I use that, uh, full disclosure, I use that as kind of bait to get other people like, hey, Lindsay's coming on, you should come on too. Um, so I appreciate it. Um, I just want to introduce you to the fans uh, who, if you haven't heard of Lindsay, by the way, what are you doing? Uh, go follow her on Twitter, I'll put it up, I'll put your Twitter follow up and whatever else you want me to put up. Um, and uh, yeah, go follow her. She's uh, actually, I'll let her describe who she is. I will say the, the fandom kind of disappeared a little bit when we started the coverage. So I'm um, not a hardcore fan as a lot of people are. I grew up around the Cincinnati Bengals. So that kind of introduced me to the love of football. My dad had season tickets my whole entire life. So going to games with him, my first game was Corey Dillon breaking the yards rushing record. Growing up with two older brothers who played the game, my dad coached. So I was definitely... A girl who was just going to love football. I, I joke and say, if you've ever watched Remember the Titans, I was a little girl with curly hair at my dad's football practices. Classic. So kind of just grew up thinking that Cincinnati Bengals were the only football team. Uh, and uh, I, I got a, a really fun opportunity to inquire almost eight years ago. And, um, you know, it's been really fun to kind of be on that route of, of player interviews, player shows, and just really, um, you know, getting to cover this team. It's, it's been, I know a lot of people want more wins, but uh, it's definitely been fun. There's been some great personalities. Awesome. And kind of that, that's a perfect kind of, uh, kind of transition to what I was, I think what's really interesting about getting to speak with people who, I don't have access to players. You know, I listen to the Locked On podcast and, you know, I've been on the Locked On podcast before actually. Jake, uh, Jake and I uh, keep in contact with James. I mean, he's got a guy in James that gets to go and actually talk to the players and coaches and I don't get a lot of that so um, just kind of wondering who's your favorite Bengal interview of all time all time honestly um, and I always think of that as a hard question because there's been a lot I, I started to go down to training camp 2011 when it was Andy Dalton and EJ Green's rookie year so I would say it's probably not a current or pat um, or recently past Bengal it was definitely Corey Dillon um, just getting the chance to interview him, and that's probably I'm kind of working around your question because obviously um, you probably want me to say a current player. No, I know I actually didn't awesome. expect you they're to awesome. at all say a current player because I mean that's a little bit. I mean, you yeah, don't, you no, don't. and, I, and I, they're they're all great. They're they're amazing to talk to. I say it all the time. The Bengals locker room is is one of the best. But um, I, I would go back to Corey Dillon because it was when the Bengals were having their 50th anniversary. He was in town, and I got a contact. Uh, with him and I had just said look we have a show on Tuesday nights it's at the Holy Grail what do we got to do to keep you in town for two more days would love to have you on the show um, you know here's the invite here's the information and he accepted and it was one of the coolest interviews because everybody knows how Corey Dillon exited out of Cincinnati um, it wasn't you know great it wasn't on awesome terms uh, but now things are things are better and, and he went off to the Patriots and rode off into the sunset and won a Super Bowl but getting the chance to interview him and just kind of his experience throughout the NFL and the hard times too I, I think you think of guys like Corey Dillon and even Chad Johnson who is the gift that keeps on giving uh, there are players that made a team fun when there wasn't a lot to root for on the field. Yes, yeah, it's um, those are my memories too. Uh, you know, like I, I think we probably grew up around the same era of Bengaldom, right? My my dad was huge, diehard Bengals fan, but I always tell him, Dad, you got to be a Bengals fan when they were good. You know, you got to see them win us. You got to see them win playoff yeah. games. Can you take kind of take us through? Uh, kind of, I think since we have kind of the same Bengals kind of historic cultural touch points along the way, um, what's the main difference between like when you were younger covering the team uh, through some pretty bad times um, versus now? You know, just general vibes. You know, I live in California, so I got to use the word vibes. It's like contractual if you have a YouTube yeah. channel. So, uh, what, you know, any anything you want to you want to cover there? I think you go back in the early stages. Um, obviously, social media has started to grow, so there's so many different things a way of covering teams. So that's been really cool to see. Um, obviously, recently, I just think that you can point to. I know. I know last year was kind of a hard year. There were a lot of 
stories out there that, you know, there was a culture problem or something like that with inside the Bengals organization. I've never bought that. I, I don't think that that's um, um, all true. Um, but, but I think of what the fan base was like, and it will be a year ago tomorrow. Um, I know we're recording this on a Thursday, so a year ago, it'll be tomorrow, the date that they drafted Joe Burrow. And I know that fans all knew back in January of the year prior to at the end of his LSU season that they were going to draft him. Everybody knew all signs were pointing to him, but, but fans didn't believe it until they called his name. And I'll say that night of draft night was one of the coolest nights to work because the excitement and look, Cincinnati Bengals fans, like they deserve so much. They deserve exciting wins and playoff wins and Super Bowls. And they haven't, you know, they, they've dealt with a lot of heartbreaking losses. So I thought it was really cool to see the city and the fan base and even on social media, people in different states and countries just get really excited about what what this team could be with him. So yeah. I guess I would just say over the last few years, it's just been really cool. And, and obviously credit to Elizabeth Blackburn. I feel like she's making a lot of changes and obviously winning's number one, um, but she's trying to include the fan base and, and get them excited for some of the off the field changes that they're trying to do. And I think you had a guy like Joe Burrow in the mix and this team is, is pretty exciting to cover. One, you touched on kind of one of the main reasons I started doing this. I've for, for as a long suffering Bengals fan who just, it just seems like there's way more, there are way more negative moments to look at in the past than, than positive. And, you know, at, at one, at one in one instance, it makes the positives way more kind of meaningful. But in another instance, it's like, man, because the only time you ever hear a Bengals story on national media is either, uh, you know, like like a, a perseverance personal story of one of the players. If it, And that's the only kind of positive story you'd hear. Other than that, it's really negative about how they're really messing things up and how nobody wants to play for them. And they the cheap and they don't want to uh, pay their players and 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 I just the reality that I was seeing as a fan really didn't match that stuff. It's it just seemed like a bunch of ill-informed uh, talking points. You could actually feel it, you know. As a Bengals fan, you're like, man, this is different. We've never had the fans engaged like this. We've never had people believing like this. You still got the old the old school people who are who are saying. Um, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. When they win a playoff game, then I'll then I'll believe it. And it's like, well, by then it's too late. You know, they need you now. You know, so that's kind of the, the idea of this channel. Uh, but I'm seeing this weird thing happening, especially right now, like in the fever pitch just before the draft starts. Of the fans seem to be convinced that the pick is Jamar Chase. The national media is like running an all-out blitz campaign for Penny Sewell, saying. You know, you see people on the media talking. I mean, you saw the Good Morning Football team, like, had this weird analogy where it's like, you know, we got to fix the stairs, but I really want this big uh, TV for my house. And, like, Penny Sewell, some, for some reason, is the stairs. I, I, w none of that makes any sense to me, but it, that's what's happening. And and on top of that, you're not, we're not getting really any hints from Duke Tobin. You know, he just had his interview. He's not like, it's not like you know, and that, that's to be expected. Duke, Duke never really gives anything away. But what's your gut say about pick number five when it comes up tomorrow and the Bengals read that pick? Uh, they are going to draft Jamar Chase. I know a lot of signs will point to it and say, oh, maybe Joe Burrow's in the room and stating that he wants the team to draft Jamar Chase. And that's why it's going to happen for my LSU. But I don't think it has to do with that. I think it's a great thing. He has a friendship with him. Joe Burrow recently said on the Chris Collinsworth podcast that he talks to Jamar all the time. Recently just talked to him last week. So, that's a great thing. You can't go wrong with the receiver and the quarterback having a great friendship. But at the same time, I think that they go Jamar Chase at the number five pick. And obviously people will tell me, and I've heard it plenty of times, and I'm going to hear it Thursday night like no other. Well, what about the offensive line? they got to protect Joe Burrow. The draft never, ever, ever ends after the first round. There are other rounds. And the only reason I feel confident they can get a playmaker like Jamar Chase is because I like this offensive line class. I think the offensive line class is far deeper than it is in the wide receiver room. And that team has to look at the future because if T. Higgins or Tyler Boyd goes down, you got Mike Thomas and Auden Tate out there. Yep. No offense to Auden Tate, but he can't <laughs> stay healthy and he's no Jamar Chase or even T. Higgins or Tyler Boyd. It's not about having a number one receiver out there. I think this team could really get star and Jamar Chase, have him to the wide receiver room, another weapon for Joe Burrow, and you get Riley Reef out there right tackle. You got Jonah Williams at left tackle. You get Quentin Spain at a at a position that he is more comfortable in, and that will be left guard to be determined if Trey Hopkins is ready to start the season. But I think Billy Price 
is more than qualified enough to start at center for the time being, even if it's just for a few weeks. And then the guy you draft in the second round, you slide him in at guard or tackle to determine on who you just feel would be best. If it's Jonah Williams, sliding him to guard, you know, that, that's a that's a question that, that we're going to have to ask as soon as we get to mini camp and, and, you know, later on in OTAs. But at the moment, I, I feel confident it's Jamar Chase, and then I think that they go offensive line in the second, maybe even third round too. That's been the kind of uh, consensus on this channel, at least, of kind of evaluating the value of the draft really is, you know, it's really... It, and really just historically, if you go and look at hit rate for wide receivers and offensive line, if you're saying that, okay, I, I understand we need, a, we need a, a, to draft offensive line and we also need to draft a wide receiver. Well, the problem is if you wait for wide receiver, the hit rate after the first round for wide receiver plummets. By the time you get to third round, the hit rate for a wide receiver is only 25%. The hit rate in a third round for an offensive lineman is close to 50%. It's 60 in the second round and like 80 in the first round, right? So... So you're still at, like the just game theory wise, the most likely way to get to having two starters at those two positions is is in order go wide receiver then offensive line, right? Yeah. And to your point about the yeah. w- regardless of Tyler Boyd and T Higgins staying healthy, even if they stay healthy, you still lost 150 plus targets last year from last year and AJ Green not being here and and uh, and John Ross leaving. And also, you know, C.J. Ozama, you're not really sure what you're going to get from C.J. It's the same as Trey Hopkins, right? Uh, they had, I think, a similar injury. I think it was Achilles, right? Like, you don't know. Achilles for uh, C.J. ACL for um, Trey. Right. So, so big, you know, those are, those are injuries that can legitimately change the type of player you are or just make it so you can't really compete at the NFL level, right? Uh, so that's Lots of question marks there, and they obviously know internally more than we do about the recovery processes of those two players. So um, I think at the end of the day, what's really difficult for Bengals fans is just trusting the organization. That when you ask them to trust, just trust the trust Zach Taylor and trust Duke Tobin, trust that they know what they're doing. They almost recoil. You know, they're like, "How dare you ask me? Like, have you seen what they've done to us?" It's almost like trauma. They're like, uh, they're like, you know, I can't trust this team. I can't trust this organization. They have to prove it to me. So I'm, a lot of times I feel like I'm fighting an uphill battle when I ask people to do that. But it's like, it's like, but they're making the decisions based on the information that we don't have and they do have. You know what I mean? So do you have any um, predictions about how 2020 is going to go with this team? I think, yeah, it all depends on, on Burrow right now. And I know he feels ahead of schedule and everything's going really great with rehab. So I wouldn't be surprised if he is starting week one. Uh, at the same time, you know, injuries can happen. They can happen with any team, not to blame, you know, last season on injuries. But I, I would say this team is, they're still they're still building. I, I wouldn't call it a, a full rebuild or anything like that because I think they're getting a lot of playmakers in the offseason. They've really done that. You look at the secondary, they doubled up. But I still think you need to add to your defensive line and your offensive line in other positions, and they can still do that. Uh, I think what we've seen the last few years with Zach Taylor and his staff is they go heavy in the early rounds for offense, and then later in the draft, and then free agency, that's when they really double down on the defensive side. So I, I think I would put this team – I'm not buying Pittsburgh. I'm really not buying them right now, and I think it's a good thing for the AFC North that Ben Roethlisberger's coming back. So I would put Cincinnati just right above Pittsburgh. Uh, as far as the Cleveland Browns, I'm, I know everybody loves what they did last season, and that's great, and they are going to be a great force on defense, but I don't believe in Baker Mayfield yet. I just don't. I, I just don't believe he's the real deal or anything like that, and I think defensive coordinators will learn how to stop him going into this next season. Uh, Baltimore, i, I got to put them at number one right now. I, I like what they are able to do in the offseason, so I'm going to keep them at one with Lamar Jackson. Yeah. I, I Probably it's I, I had this question the other day. I'd put it's Cleveland and Cincy right there, two three, like super close. Yeah, it could go. And then way. I'm probably putting Pittsburgh at four. And I know a lot of people would think like, why in the world would you put Pittsburgh at four? I just I don't believe in them. I think that they're they're getting older. Um, obviously they they got Wad on the defensive side and they're still okay on that end. But at the same time, I just don't think I think Ben Roethlisberger is old. I think yeah. he's getting old, and yeah. I think that that's a good thing for the AFC North. Yeah, I think that um, uh, when you're t- speaking of Baker, um, I have my best friend growing up uh, was a Browns. He's still my he's still my best friend. I was in his wedding. He was in mine. I mean, he was a Browns fan. I was a Bengals fan. All all growing up. So like we have this always. I know way more about the Browns than I really want to because of that. And he, vice versa for the Bengals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is about Baker, 
Um, the different, I, always, I always tell them this. Like, look, man, I watched Andy Dalton for a decade you know, play, playing for the Bengals. The difference between a good and a great quarterback is very simple. Is not is not the is not the, the high end splash plays that they can make because at the NFL level, all quarterbacks can make those incredible plays every once in a while, right? The difference is not those. It's how they mitigate the really stupid plays, the really dumb throws. And the problem with Baker is throughout the season, you just see really dumb throws where it's like he didn't he didn't read that at all. He had no idea that guy was going to be there. And you can't. Until you fix that, until you fix those bonehead throws, those like, what is he, who, you know, the, the thing where everybody's going like this, every, you know, it's like, that has to be fixed. And, and, and if you start, and if you watch a guy like um, Russell Wilson's probably the, the, the biggest example of this for me, he'll, he'll make just these ridiculous plays all the time. And then, but, but what's, he and Aaron Rodgers are like this, They'll, he'll dink and dunk you for three quarters not making sure to not make that huge mistake, right? And then in the fourth quarter, just make three or four incredible plays and put up, you know, 21 points in the fourth quarter and it's over, you know? So uh, the problem is if you're going, you know, like we saw this with Andy Dalton a lot, he would throw two picks in the first half and then play amazing in the second half, but it just isn't enough, you know, because you got down so much. And now all of a sudden the defense knows you have to throw. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. On ba I agree with you on Baker. I think that's really kind of a uh, good take on, on him. I, not to say that he can't learn, right? Right, because it, at a certain level, it's like recognizing what you can't do and just not trying it, right? So uh, he could very well learn and get better at that. But as of right now, just like you said, I don't trust him. I don't trust him to to, and it does. Sometimes it looks like he doesn't trust his own what he's seeing, and that's where he really gets in trouble. It's when he's starting to not trust what he sees. Um, so I have to ask because it's a Bengals channel. You're from the Cincinnati area. You grew up right around right around there you don't eat cheese on your skyline no i don't like cheese at all no it's not cheese. a dairy problem or anything i just don't like just it specifically not cheese. a cheese person that's incredible i no, just don't like it i don't i don't get melted on there it's skyline is just fine without cheese oh i agree i, I like it, it. Either way. I, so yeah like i said i live out here on the west coast i can't obviously can't get skyline so in order to eat it i have to order the cans and then get you know the right hot dogs and the buns and stuff it's a whole situation but a lot of times you know when you make your own skyline you've got the big pot and you, you have more chili than you have like spaghetti or whatever or hot dogs and you've got it left over it's fine just pour it over crackers or whatever it's it's good the way it is so uh have you bought any of the new jerseys yet no, I don't. I don't need to buy any for me. Um, you know, maybe for my dad for Father's Day, he can he can get one. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I haven't either. Um, I'm kind of waiting because I tend to get a lot of Bengals gear for like holidays, <laughs> so I don't want to buy stuff and then get another one coming up to at whatever the next holiday is. So we'll see. And I don't. I don't live in the area, so it's, I'm not around. I don't have a lot walking around in san diego with a bengals jersey on just isn't as cool as it as it is in cincinnati so so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so i don't get a lot of chance i set outside of these videos to to wear a lot of my bengals uh, gear so but no i did do you like the do you like the new look though i do i i think the bengals did a great job with that i know that the the reveal of it happened about an hour before you wanted it to i think the jersey looks clean and sleek and there is a difference i know a lot of people are like oh it looks the same as past jerseys it doesn't um, I love the white uh, pant combo. I like the different stripes and making them different. And also, uh, one of my favorite things, we, we were at the Jersey Reveal this past week and had a chance to talk to Elizabeth about it and then other people who were in charge of the uniform design. And I asked her about the Paul Brown signature. Yeah. You know, kind of what, what happened there? How, how did somebody come up with that? And, and Nike presented it to them and said, look, we should, we should you guys should probably add this signature. I really like this. And, and the Bengals were all, they were, of course, they loved yeah. it. So I love the, the Paul Brown signature on the neckline. I think that's a great, great just addition to the jerseys. But I think they look clean. They look, yeah. they look really sharp. I'm with you. I like the cleaner look. I think that, I think that uh, they also have the opportunity because this this set of uniforms doesn't have like a it doesn't have a color rush and it doesn't have a throwback. Those are two options down the road. So the Bengals could do, for example, people are like, oh, I want I want orange pants. You know, like they could do a color rush that's an all orange like type mm -hmm. of color rush, and then that gets them the orange pants. And then the throwback. Let I'll ask you like last question. Um, if they do a throwback, 
Would you rather them go back to like the '90s with the leaping, t- like the Corey Dillon leaping tiger on the sleeve? Would you like like go back to more like the '80s of, to the Super Bowl teams, um, or would you like even farther with the bent? Like, I don't think they'll get rid of the. I don't think you're allowed to have a different helmet. Maybe for throw. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, you're not allowed. It's yeah. just the one. So they couldn't change the helmet with like the Bengal where it says Bengals on it, you know, instead of uh, the stripes, but. Do you have a preference, or, or I think I think any of them that they would do would look good, to be honest. But yeah, I, I honestly like the ones from the the eighties and then early nineties. I, I think the ones where I just was like, ah, oh, there's a lot going on. Was two thousand? I, I want to say the last seventeen years. Yeah, uh, yeah. Prior to the ones in twenty twenty one, I think that there was just so much going on. And honestly, the Bengals do have the best color rush uniform. I will say that 100%. Oh, yeah. I think that white jersey is sharp looking. Um, at the same time, there is there is potential for them to have a throwback in the future. So I think, uh, yeah, I think you can't go wrong with anything in the 80s or 90s. It, it just looks cool. It looks sharp. And only doing it every now and then. I think it would yeah. be really cool. And look, there's a lot that goes into all of the uniforms and what you wear, how you're going to wear it, when you're going to wear it. But when they announced the Ring of Honor to do some kind of throwback yes. uh, uniform would be really sharp. But again, that could take more things behind the scenes that I don't know about yet. Yeah, but exactly, uh, yeah. I think that would be cool. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure. I really, uh, really thank you for coming on and introducing yourself to I don't know how anybody that is watching this channel doesn't know who you are. But in case they don't, this is Lindsay, and she covers, okay. the, ben- <laughs> she covers the Bengals. I've been Mike, she's been Lindsay, and this has been Who Daily. See ya.